we have a special special chapel today. Definitely uh, looking forward and looking forward to hearing this um, from our guest Keith Keith Weaver. It is special. It's a special chapel because we're celebrating the uh, tyrant after 22 years. Uh, leading as moderator, but also as part of our board of directors ex officio for all these all these years. I Thirty-four think. years. Thirty-four. Oh no, twenty-two is ex officio. Yeah. <laughs> twenty-two ex officio. Yeah. So you went there before. I was okay. there before, yeah. And um, just to uh, to introduce our time <coughs> this morning, I I found I found this. I was thinking about Keith, and then. Uh, um, Talking to Jennifer, what were you, Jennifer? So, so the idea of wisdom, right? The idea. Of, so, we're celebrating the wisdom, the wisdom that uh, that God has put in your life or built in your life. It was not there before, so I guess uh, it took some, some time. Like <laughs> it usually is the case. Like it usually is the case for all of us. Yeah. So I found this, and um, this is according to the American Journal of. Geriat geriatrics. Like <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not suggesting. <laughs> it, it's just where he was, right? I'm not suggesting anything, but <laughs> psychiatry. Huh? <laughs> here, here are seven traits of the wise person. So you are wise if, if, if and when, when you offer sound life advice, and it's never unsolicited. Is that the right way? It's never solicited. It's not unsolicited. You don't, you don't offer it when they are not asking you. <laughs> Only when they pe when people ask. Oh, okay. that's, that's it. That's what it is. Number two, intellectual humility. You're wise because you know what you do not know. Mm -hmm. Right? You yeah. know what you don't know. Tell me about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You are wise when you consider others' perspectives and look at the bigger picture, right? It's not just my way or the highway, as you say. Number four, you are willing, you're wise when you're willing to compromise. Hmm. Find a third way, find a way to do things. And five, you realize, you're wise when you realize that change is the only constant in life. Change will always be there. Number six, you are wise when you have keen insight and the ability to reflect on your thoughts, emotions, and actions. And number seven, you are wise when you have a great sense of humor. And I think, I think, I think I really strongly this is how I have experienced you, <laughs> Keith, especially for the last 17 months hmm. that we've been working as close together. So let me just uh, begin uh, or continue with this scripture coming from Proverbs chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. This is coming from the New Living Translation, by the way. Hmm. Don't run, no, don't turn your back on wisdom, for she will protect you. Love her, and she will guard you. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. So let's pray. Mm. Father, we uh, are <coughs> excited. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's a, mix of, it's a mixed bag of emotions. We're excited, but also at the same time. Mm. <laughs> Father, what, what, what's happening? But we know, we know that you are in control. That's our faith. That's what we believe, Lord. Mm -hmm. Nothing happens by chance. You have a time for everything in life. There's time for work and there's time for retirement. There's time to be active and, and drive the, the mission and there's time to rest and let others do it. So thank you, God, for the wisdom in life. The wisdom that we all receive through life experiences, sometimes really hard life experiences. But Father, we're always learning. And that's the beauty of following you, Lord Jesus, that you, you, we are learning. You are the rabbi, you are the teacher, you are the model, and we follow after you. Thank you for the life of Keith. Uh, yeah, it, 
allow us to hear the wisdom that he has accumulated for all these 22 years, especially the last 22 years of his life, working as moderator, as part of our women. In the name of Christ, continue blessing uh, our lives through the presence of the Holy Spirit amongst us. Amen. 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 Time is yours. Well, thank you, Marvin. That's a tall order, although 20 minutes should be more than enough to share the wisdom that I have. I, I think that we'll cover it easily, but you know. Um, actually, yesterday I talked to Felixa and had a helpful clarification of my assignment here this morning, because I, I, was, I was thinking about sharing mostly about my experience for the last 34 years in my relationship with EMM and the EMM board and the LMC EMM relationship. I shared some of that at an EMM board meeting, but then Felix clarified, no, we, we want to hear your life story. So that was a shift. But then I thought, well, did I ever have a life other than EMM LMC? And so I, um, I will try to share uh, some of the life story and as it relates to LMC and EMM. I'd like to start with this um, sentence. I found this to be really interesting. Listen to this. Through our union with Christ, we too have been claimed by God as His inheritance. Before we were born, He gave us our destiny that we would fulfill the plan of God who always accomplished every purpose and plan in his heart. Well, that's a pretty outlandish sentence. It's, it's Ephesians 1.11 <laughs> with the Passion Translation. The NLT, New Living Translation, puts it this way. <clears throat> Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God for he chose us in advance, and he makes everything work out according to his plan. Or from the most familiar NIV, in him we are also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. And I think, <clears throat> I think the thing that has given me most satisfaction in life is to know that our story is nested in God's larger redemptive purposes and God's larger redemptive story. And that's in the two preceding verses. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In Colossians 1, 19, 20, for God was blessed, pleased, sorry, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things on heaven, by making peace through his blood on the cross. And so how cool is that, that our lives become a small part of God's large, eternal, redemptive purposes. And in the toughest times of life, I just um, rested in that promise that God is at work. And God is doing what God will do, and we get to be a little part of that. So after Flix clarified my purpose this morning, or my assignment this morning, uh, include uh, part of my life story, I thought about the invitation I had from Historical Society some three years ago to be part of their storytelling event. Every year they have a storytelling event where they invite two people to come and share a series of short stories, like seven short stories. And I, uh, my first reaction, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to do that. And then I thought about it, prayed about it, and, and it felt the Lord nudged me, yeah, go ahead and do this. And you know, I actually enjoy that, writing these little stories. And so when she clarified this yesterday, I thought, well, I went to those seven stories. Now I'm not going to share all seven. That would take more than the 20 minutes I have. I already am going to be challenged. <laughs> 20 minutes. But, so I decided to share the first story I told that night. Story number one. Um, I had some introductory comments, which I'll avoid here. But while my stories are not dramatic, they are unique to me. In that sense, one of a kind. 
More importantly, each of our stories, your story, my story, connect to God's larger story, which I just spoke about. God speaks to us in our story if we slow down long enough to reflect on our story. After all, we usually do not learn from experience, only from experience upon which we reflect. And Patrick Kiefer taught us that many years ago. I think it was Danish philosopher and theologian Kierkegaard who said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forward. So I want um, to make a humble attempt to share my life backwards. And then I had seven stories that I told. But in the process, I want to acknowledge the faithfulness of God in Psalm 89.1. I will sing of your steadfast love, O Lord, forever with my mouth. I will proclaim your faithfulness to all generations. Over the years, I have observed that God uses little inconsequential yet formative incidents to set the trajectory of our lives towards his will and purpose, especially in early life. So I'll begin with one such incident in my life. I was in fifth grade and I set up a little workbench in the basement of our little house there in Farmersville. And somewhere I saw a picture of a small four-legged flower plant and I decided to make one. So with the most basic hand tools, I cut out the curved legs and attached them to a round top. And I'm sure it was quite crude, but I gave it to my mom as a Mother's Day gift. And she raved over its beauty. Although I didn't know it then, that affirmation sent me on a life trajectory, which I'll loop back to later. That fall, I think it was a week or two before Thanksgiving, I was mowing lawn for what was likely the last time for the season. And after several rounds, I noticed that this mower was mowing, was crooked. You could tell the front wheel was out of adjustment. So this was a Hawn Eclipse mower. This is, this is a good mower because you could stop the blade and let the motor run. Dave's remembering those days. You're dating yourself, brother. <laughs> so I was able to disengage the blade, idle the engine, then I proceeded to lift the front of the mower to just the front wheel, which I did. But with the engine idling, I couldn't hear that the blade was still coasting but I felt it. <laughs> and it was, to my dismay, discovered that I'd lost the tips of my two fingers. And some of you have seen that over the years. There's, there's, there's uh, stubs. I got, I got stubbies there. The moral of the story is don't reach under a mower, long mower. I went into the house and asked for Band-Aids. <laughs> but my mother knew better and took me to the effort at ER where the surgeon cleaned things up best he could. There were two weird things about that experience that I remember. <laughs> Our neighbors found the one fingertip in their lawn. <laughs> so we put it in a bottle of alcohol and showed everyone who wanted to see it. <laughs> I <don't> know. <laughs> Pretty gross in retrospect. The other part of the story is that I had been taking violin lessons. And at the time of the accident, we had just begun preparing for the Christmas recital with several classmates at the Brownstown Elementary School. I remember feeling so relieved <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> that without my fingertips, I no longer needed to worry about that Christmas recital. <laughs> what I didn't realize then is that those missing fingertips would eventually impact the direction of my life. And then I sat down, and then the next person shared their story, and then I got up and shared the second story, which I won't take time. <laughs> but I will summarize. I will summarize how that little incident shifted the trajectory of my life. So later in high school, that's a long story, but um, I... I decided in my senior year of high school that it would really be good to have some typing skills. I might need them someday. So I took typing one, no one, whatever. 
And I went to that class and realized that these were all these ninth grade girls around me. And by the third week, they were typing. And I was there <laughs> trying to find the keys. And I couldn't feel the keys with my stubbies. And I said, well, this is ridiculous. I, re I quit the class. And the guidance counselor said, well, what do you want to do? I said, well, I'll take a double period of shop. And that year, my senior year of high school, every afternoon I went to shop class because I had learned to love woodworking. You remember why? You know, I think my mother's affirmation of that rickety little flower thing I made. And you know, it's interesting. I had, I had really significant success in that, in that shop class. My teacher encouraged me to do something that I didn't think I could do, and I did it, and it was, it was very successful. I won a national scholarship, that thing, and, um, and found some, found some self-confidence, my woodworking. So after graduation, I thought, man, I want a little wood shop in my class, I mean, at my home. And mom said, no way, I ain't having a wood shop in my basement, <laughs> which I understand now. I didn't then. That summer, um, I, I found a, a guy, Lester Reif, out there at Hinkleton, the body shop guy, was, was building a house around his house trailer. And I stopped and said, hey, you gonna sell that house trailer? He said, yeah. I said, I'll take it. How much? $300, I'll take it. My parents happened to be on a three-week vacation <laughs> in, in California, and it never occurred to me that I should check with that. <laughs> but I, I took our little farm away out to Lester Rife. I backed up and I hooked up to that house trail. <laughs> we pulled it, got it out, and I went putting down the road. And it wasn't until I was going up the back side of the Fairmount Hill and I noticed the tires started slipping a little bit, and I thought, this might be a little oversized for this tractor. <laughs> anyway, I got that trailer, pulled in past the house behind the garage, set it up back there until my parents come home. I had that thing wired up to the main service, and Dad said, what is this? <laughs> Uh, we had a lot of fun. My buddies, we built all kinds of stuff in that shop. And then my dad decided to sell the place. And then the, the new owner said he'll buy it on one condition. <laughs> Guess what that is? That house trailer's got to go. <laughs> I said, what's well, my shop? So I, I realized Joanna and I had been dating for some time. I hadn't yet proposed to her. But I realized, hmm, I guess I'm going to have to find a place of my own. I don't find a wood shop. Because I knew Dad wasn't going to let me pull it behind his new house that he was building. <laughs> so, you know, I started watching for properties. And in the effort of New Holland area, properties were outrageous. I mean, you'd have to pay $60,000 for a property <laughs> that, that had any kind of land. And so I, f I saw this. Um, well, actually, in the meantime, I decided to propose. I, yeah, anyway, Joanne and I were, nobody knew it yet, but we were engaged. Anyway, I told, I called Joanne and said, hey, there's a four-acre property for sale. Where? Well, it's this place called Reinhold's. And I actually had to ask my dad for directions to this place. <laughs> and we got there, and Joanne and I walked through, and it was basically just a shell of a house. It really... I remember we were down in the basement, a cellar, not basement, a cellar. We stopped and prayed and asked for God's wisdom. But I knew we didn't want this place. And then the bidding started, and he couldn't get a bid for $15,000. I raised my hand. <laughs> and he, he, after a while, he looked at me and said, sold! <laughs> I almost wet myself because I... I, I I didn't, I didn't even have a checkbook along. <laughs> you know, that was just in time to find a new church right at about the time they were looking for another pastor. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go there for that, but 
that's what happened. And I say just in time because by that time I had already been getting pretty involved in the business world and really enjoying it. And, 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 and some of the things that were happening and the journey we were on in, in, in the place where I worked, it's pretty exciting. And I think another year or two, I'd have been in that deep enough that I would not have been willing to say, okay, I'll give that all up because the church was calling. Now, um, they used the lot and the way it worked in those days was you had a qualification one Sunday, qualification sermon one Sunday, they took nominations the next Sunday, and they ordained the person the next Sunday. Joanne and I happened to be on with my family on vacation the week of the qualification sermon. I remember thinking, ugh, <clears throat> I better get that tape. <laughs> so I got that tape and listened to it. Anyway, long story short, that led to the call to ministry, and I could, that's another whole series of stories, but which led to then nine years later, a bishop ordination by lot, and all of a sudden, I found myself at my first EMM board meeting, 34 years ago, the Salonga Meeting House, and sure enough, all of a sudden, I found myself at the last EMM LMC Joint Chapel. How did this all happen? Boom! So most of my life has been this story. And, and you know, Ephesians 1.11, before we were born, he gave us our destiny. That we would fulfill the plan of God who always accomplished every purpose and plan in his heart. And so God uses these little inconsequential yet formative incidents to set us on a trajectory for his will and purpose. And I would have to say that the LMC EMM story is such, such, has been such a big part of my life. I mean, it, it's mostly all I remember. And I remember that first EMM board meeting at the meeting house in Salonga. And Jay Garber, with Joe, was chair of the board. Yep, Jay's, uh, Jay Garber, Joe's father. Paul Landis was the president. Norman Shanks, vice president. Ira Burkholder Street. How many of you remember Ira Burkholder? I mean Buckwalter. Two of you. At the EMM board I asked that question, not a single hand one of us. What the world? How do you guys not remember Ira? Well, <laughs> it's a long time ago. <coughs> and the thing I remember about that board meeting is the intentionality of the seating. Very intentional. In fact, I found in your archives an EMM board meeting minute where the board took some time to discuss the possibility of changing that seating arrangement. <laughs> so a lot of thought went into that seating arrangement. And basically, as a joint board at the front table, and I'm going to make a little confession here, but at the front table was the chair, your dad, the president of the EMM board, Paul Ennis and the LMC moderator. They, those three men sat at the front table. And then the executive board of EMM sat in a circle. And then the board sat behind them. And then, and, and then the, well, the, 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 bishop, the mission board in those days was like 60 people. So they sat behind. So it was the executive committee and all the board. 60 people because the board was made up of representatives from all the churches or districts, churches. And then the bishops were in the outside ring. And the life members. And then the life members, who were these elderly people who were part of the for all their life. But the confession I want to make is, well, actually the joint board meetings had stopped by that time, but the confession I want to make is that when I got called to moderator, I was invited to sit at that front desk with the president, of EMM and the chair of the board, and I said, ah, I'm, I'm, I was, you know, I'm too humble for that. I don't do that. <laughs> and so they didn't fight it, and I didn't sit up there. But you know, in retrospect, that was a mistake. That was a mistake because there was something very symbolic about that seating arrangement, and I bucked the system. Yeah. Um, Raymond Charles came to me at the end of that meeting 
And it must have been one of his last meetings because his health was failing. And he said to me, now Keith, you're we talking about the, di the differences between the bishop board and the MM board. But the MM board, he said, Keith, this, this, this is where it's at. Right, right here is where it's at. And so I left that conversation, huh. There must be there must be some dynamics between the EMM board and the and the bishop board. And you know, Ralph Winters talks a lot about that dynamic, and I don't think I understood that dynamic. And one could make the case that you gotta understand that dynamic between the modality and the sodality. Ralph Winters coined those terms: modality, sodality. <clears throat> the modality is the church that's centered and, and, and at one place, like the parish, um, to, to care for what is. The, soda, the sodality church is being sent um, to, 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 to create what is not yet. And both are vital to the mission of God. And there are interesting dynamics. Well, that's my life story, living in that in that balance and oh my there are so many there's such a story of consolation and desolation in that story and I, I didn't know if I'd have time but but I'll I'll just really quickly fly through examples like you do have time. 20 minutes is over <laughs> anyway Examples of the consolation, um, amazing stories that grew out of this partnership between EMM and the church, this call to mission, and how many times did it happen that a, that, that a Lancaster County family would sell their home and go to missions? And one little example is James and Beatrice Hess common LMC folk lived here in Lancaster County decided God was calling the mission and EMM as the Sodality Church facilitated their going and they went to Honduras and they got to Tegucigalpa most of you know this story got to Tegucigalpa and they said well you know there's enough churches here we go up to the hinterlands of northern Honduras and you plant a church there so they went up there and here they found these Griffin people and they started ministry among the Griffin people. One of their first persons to be baptized was Celso Jaime. Mm. Celso Jaime became the papa of the Griffin churches. Eventually moved to New York, Griffin churches are planted. And just last summer, the board this past summer, the Board of Bishops recognized the Evangelical Griffin Mission in the 17 congregations as a network of Griffin churches within LMC. Mm -hmm. Well, that's 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 wonderful. That's 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 the the sodality and the modality working together at its best. And there are how many more stories? Your parents. And, um, oh, your parents, Keith. You were talking about your parents going to Mexico, mm -hmm. and 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 so all over that 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 happened. The Wangers, the Shanks, the Hagies. Etc. Et another another consolation in those years that I remember is the robust church planting initiative that LMC and EMM launched together, and Glenn Yoder was at the head of that charge. I mean, he led that charge, and I was I, I remember those stories, man. I I, I was so they, they they had Glenn Yoder had this thing really put together well. It was really structured. You had each church planter had a coach. Coach met with Glenn. We had uh, responsibilities. It was a whole infrastructure of supporting church planting, and and um, and so churches were planted all over the East Coast in those years. It's just a wonderful story. A another consolation is the way EMM and LMC worked together to to tend these these global relationships that were birthed through our sending and mission. And it, um, at one point, EMM, well, yeah, I, I, it's, it's a long story about how bishops would, 
would show up in the mission field to check up on the missionaries. And that infamous letter that Chester Wanger sent back to the bishop's Lord, you, you may come, we'll be happy to see you, but we just want you to know we aren't going to have our plain suits on. <laughs> That's a problem. But, but we, we got through those years until, until um, we had this arrangement. We, we appointed fraternal bishop representatives. And so we had bishop fraternal representatives to Asia, to Africa, to Europe, to um, Central America, South America. And, 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 and now that whole system has been replaced with our global delegate, Tom, and the, and the IPDs, the International Partner Delegates. And so here we are today with these profound fraternal relationships with the churches all around the world. It's just an amazing story. It's praise be to the Lord. It's just, just, just wonderful. And today, what we're experiencing here is just such a consolation, but there were also some desolation along the way. I think when I shared with the EMM board, I mostly dwelled on the desolation. When I shared with the <laughs> when I shared with the LMC staff the other day, it was all desolation. Man, we, there's some good in this story too, so I wanted to start with that. But the desolation, man, some of the tensions, ay ay ay. Um, in the late 80s, EMM had a home ministries budget of $1.3 million. Amazing funding for home ministries, church planting, um, that, that, that budget was used to help fund bishops. So, you know, Luke Stoss, who's in Philadelphia, was funded by Home Ministries for his bishop oversight. And Monroe Yoder in New York City, and Glenn Yoder in, in, in Alabama, and on and on and on. And so there was this weird mix of bishop oversight and EMM funding. And, and, and then the question emerged as these churches are planted, who, who gives oversight to these churches? Does EMM Home Ministries or do the bishops? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. And then I remember, I, I remember it as if it happened yesterday when Glenn Yoder began to tell us that he was getting pushed back from bishops. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can't do that in my district. And it led to more desolation because Glenn decided, okay, forget it. If we can't have this network of churches in, in their respective districts, we'll just pull them all together into a separate entity within LMC. And the bishops weren't having that either. And so Richard Showalter had the tough job to figure out what to do. And I remember when Glenn left us, oh man, you know, it seems like whenever we get momentum going, in a, a robust church planting movement, something crazy happens, you know. Like, like the, the story of Joe Rosa. I won't get into that, but it was a terrible desolation. Uh, and then there were the funding questions uh, and tensions. So the bishops had control of the offering schedule. And a lot of EMM funds were coming from that offering. Half our congregations used that offering schedule, and the bishops decided how many offerings EMM would get. <laughs> and, you know, that created its own little... And then the bishops launched this unified budget to give... You remember that, Carol? No, the unified budget? Anyway, how many remember the unified budget? Nobody remembers the unified budget. <laughs> that was a long time ago. Anyway, anyway, that, that added to the offering schedule some of the other agencies like Landis Homes and, and all of a sudden EMM wasn't the only one on that offering schedule. And so, so all this stuff, you know, had dynamics and, 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 and there's some desolation in that. Probably the, probably the greatest desolation in my story um, are the leadership, the painful leadership transitions that happened. I remember when <clears throat> Paul Landis was accused of inappropriate behavior in the investigation process that started. And 
the bishops, either Paul Landis was a bishop, and so as a credential leader, the, the, the conference leadership led that investigation, and it created really awkward dynamics between LMC and EMM, between the Landis family, and then of course, more recently, Nelson's, Nelson Orcaña's transition, and these are very painful times. Um, all sort of embedded in my life story. I told Marcia that when I, when I was preparing to share the LMC reflections, I, I almost experienced trauma of reliving all this stuff. And I went to bed and I couldn't sleep. I said, oh my word, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff. The, the irony is, and the LMC staff really pointed this out the other day, the irony is that God shapes us and forms us, both individually and corporately, as much in the desolation as in the consolation. Now that is something. Mm -hmm. that, that God forms us and shapes us in these hard times. Ephesians is one of them. Before we were born, he gave us our destiny that we fulfill the plan of God who always accomplished every purpose and plan in his heart. And so I want to say this. <laughs> Did I get your attention, Becky? <laughs> <laughs> this current EMM LMC partnership and collaboration is a remarkable gift of the Spirit. It's been our mutual aspiration for many years, but it's been really challenging to get there. It doesn't, it doesn't happen automatically. And I can say in my 43 years since I've been ordained, it's been a little bumpy along the way. But what we have today is something to tend and to cherish and nurture. And I would suggest that it's for the good of LMC, but all of EMM's constituent church bodies to have this sodality-modality partnership where we share together in God's mission, we're going to get much farther working together than working separately. And so here we are, we have this shared aspiration to be a spirit-led movement, to make disciples of Jesus, and mobilize every member as a missionary, and plant churches all over the place. And I think EMM and LMC are better postured to do that today than any time in my story. And I would suggest to you that this amazing place that we're in might have more to do, excuse me, bishop friends, with the shift that bishops have made than anything EMM has done. Because I think bishops have, bishops have been able to shift from that maintenance mode to a missional mode without forsaking the, mo the modality role that they have to play. They made that shift from housekeeping to empowering for the mission of God. <clears throat> And I, and I think it is just so significant. So I would conclude by saying thank you EMM for hanging with us. Not too long ago, there was some serious conversation in my office about the idea of EMM being set free from such close ties to the church to be a parachurch mission without ties to any specific church. And I'm glad that didn't happen. I'm glad that happened. And I said in the EMM board, and I'll say it here, I think Jerry Keener will have an extra big crown in heaven because he worked really hard to tend that relationship, to bring clarity to it. And now here we are. We've been through Exponential. We've been through the Movement Accelerator. Marvin, you've been at the center of working at this. And, and, and I think we are postured to have the modality and the sodality working together for the mission of God and who knows what can happen. So as I retire, I see the wonderful way that EMM and LMC are working together. I feel like Simeon of old, who in Luke 2 was waiting for the consolation of Israel and when he finally saw the Christ child, he declared what I'm declaring. Now let your servant depart in peace. <laughs> According to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation. And that's how I'm going into retirement. Just so very grateful. I don't know if I'll die tomorrow or not, but, well, 10 days. I guess 
I have 10 days, I should wait 10 days. <laughs> I'm 10 days on my, they put his iPad marking my days. So I don't know if I'll die in 11 days from now or not, but I'm just grateful to the Lord for the journey this has been. And, and I, I, I honestly believe that, that that call to ministry probably wouldn't have come in my home creation at Hess Mennonite, but it did back there in Reinhold's. And how did I get there? Because I cut my fingertips off. Ah, you know. It, but for, for me, it all stitches together. It all stitches together, and God moves things. And so um, here I am at my last EMM. L By the way, EMM LMC joint chapels 30 years ago, planned by a joint planning committee. Isn't it amazing? We're back doing it again. So, thank you, and uh, I just pray God's blessing on all of you as you carry forward in the mission of God to be the Spirit-led movement that we all hope to be. Amen. <laughs>
kids, if you yes. if you extend a blessing <coughs> yes. towards Yemen, the sodalic <coughs> format mm -hmm. of, of our system here, mm -hmm. especially our leadership team, as we continue mm -hmm. strategizing and developing this vision. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord, thank you that you are about your eternal purposes to redeem and renew and restore all things through Christ. Thank you that in Christ you're going to gather all things up together as one new humanity in him. And thank you, Lord, for the stories of your faithfulness through salvation history and how from generation to generation to generation there are those who you called and you sent into your mission and so we thank you for the story that is LMC and EMM for the way your Holy Spirit stirred up within this uh, Swiss German community here after several hundred years of silence um, a mission passion that has been fanned into full flame in the in the expression of EMM and Lord thank you for the way that you have blessed um, the church through the ministries of EMM all these years and for these wonderful fraternal relationships we have now with the global family of God. And so I pray, O oh Father, that you would continue to accomplish your purposes through this, this modal church and sodal church, LMC and EMM. I pray your blessing on EMM, that you would continue to carry out your eternal purposes through them. I pray for the leadership team from Marvin and his leaders and all the staff of EMM for all the workers who are scattered around the world that you would prosper their ministry that they would continue to feel the empowerment of your spirit to be continue to be sent by the church into your mission so that they can grow and build those things that are not yet so that the church can find new expression in new places in the world and I pray Lord also for LMC that they can continue to be the modal church that they're called to be to be the the place that cares for and tends what is already, and that together EMM and LMC can work to get in a seamless way to be about your mission. And so Holy Spirit, pour out your power, pour out your wisdom, pour out your guidance upon these people as they lead LMC and EMM going forward. I look forward, Lord, to stories about your faithfulness, how you take little incidents and set us off in other trajectories, new trajectories. And so I pray, Lord, that Together we could experience in all the fullness of your calling to be a spirit-led movement, making disciples of Jesus all over the place, here at home and around the world, and mobilizing every member as a missionary and planting churches. Lord, may this be done for your glory and for your praise, not for ours, not for uh, setting up some church body or some mission agency, but that through your spirit at work in us, your kingdom could be advanced in the world so that, so that your kingdom can come on this earth as it is in heaven. So again, I pray your blessing. Walk with them, go with them, empower them, lead them. Again, all this for your glory. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. You're welcome. Bless you.